Um, all right. Well, it is my privilege to uh, wrap up our uh, evening tonight. Well, we're going to have something right afterwards, not completely wrap up, but the last message of tonight uh, on the sovereignty of God, the supreme power and authority. That's what the sovereignty, uh, the word sovereignty um, means. And because I'm out of fishing stories, because I've told my only one last night, those of you that weren't here, let that be a lesson to you all to come to conferences on time. Um, but... Um, I'll tell you a story about building a fence, because, you know, that's what I do on my weekends. I don't know what you guys do. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to build the fence. As some of you guys know, I live in Sacramento, California. And uh, California is where you go when you want to have a bad time with the government, all right? Um, because... If you try to build a fence, there's a series of rules that I had to look up. It, it took forever just to figure out what I had to do and all the phone numbers I had to call to get all the permits and the permissions. It's a fence, right? But you have to call, and then you wait, and they come out and mark up your property for any lines that might be you know, running across it. Like eight different people have to come out. And then we finally say, okay, we think we're good. Then I have to figure out how close I, I, I can build it to, like, the property line. And so finally we're like, you know what? Nobody gives me a straight answer. I'm just going to build it right on the property line. We start to build. We cut a bunch of, like, internet lines. So now I have to call back again. Yeah, real, I mean, a real deal. So now I'm, like, trying to freak out, like, which of my neighbors did I just, like, completely um, hijack their internet? The people come back again. It's another week of permits, another week of things until we figure out it was an old line. Nobody was actually using it. So, folks, the end of the story is I've got a fence on my property now. <laughs> but I honestly don't know when the city's going to come by and tell me to take it down. So I'm just kind of I'm waiting for that moment when they say, well, you got the wrong permit. Um, I bring that around to the fact that when we talk about sovereignty, oh, I, I was going to say, guys, next slide, but I can control it. I have sovereignty over the, over the slides. Um, when we talk about sovereignty, this is how my aunt went to build a fence. She moved down to Texas, and so she's like, well, you know, she moved from California, so she's like, I got to go follow the rules. So she goes down to the civil, uh, like the planning office, and she's like, all right, guys, well, uh, I'm trying to build a fence. What's the rules? And they look at her, and they're like, is it your property, ma'am? She's like, it is. You're building the fence? I am. I'm like, go build the fence. <laughs> like, well, what are you asking us for? Just go build the thing. Different definitions of sovereignty here, okay? One place, California, you can't build a thing because everybody else has rights and, and restrictions on what you can and can't do. And then you go to Texas and they're like, it's your property. Go build a thing. Go to Home Depot. Buy it. Did you steal the material? No, you bought it. It's yours. Then go build it. Um, there's a difference in, in what that looks like, in what sovereignty looks like in our life. There are some things we control and some things we don't. And some things that we, we think we control until we lose control. I was in Starbucks the other day and I, I see this man ordering his coffee and his arm is limp. Like just, it's, it's completely, you can see that there's no muscle there, it's just a limp, he has zero control over that arm, and you think, thank God I've got control of my arms, because you think you, you've got sovereignty over your own body until you don't, right? So what is sovereignty, and then how does it pertain to our topic of the conference, the, the sovereignty of God? When we start to talk about God controlling our life and the world and everything around us, right? You get into some really hairy situations, folks. Because then you have to ask, well, 9-11 happened. Does God control that? The hurricanes, right? Does God control all that? When, when in our church a, a, a man dies and leaves his wife and kids behind, four kids, and you think, God, did, did you let that happen? How, how could a good God allow that to happen? My grandpa died recently, 20 years suffering, living without a kidney, going to dialysis every day. His arms, they couldn't find the veins in his arms anymore. Just that suffering every other day, having to go through the pain of all of your blood being sucked out of your body to be replaced with new blood. Would you allow that, God? When you get fired, your family has uh, no money, when you're a pastor in India and they come in and they burn your house down, when you're the wife of the pastor and they see, you see your husband nailed to a tree to make mockery of Christ's sacrifice, and you think, God, you would do that? 
You would allow something like that to happen when a kid is born with birth defects? When you're in a relationship where your husband is abusive, or maybe your wife doesn't care, or your kids are hooked on something they shouldn't be, and you think, God, why would you allow all that to happen? You're sovereign, and you're good. So how does that work together? Man, that question, I know you've asked yourself, I know if you're serious about your faith, and if you've been witnessing to others, others have asked of you and said, how could a good God allow these things or makes them happen? Is he not sovereign or is he not good? Which one is it? If you will, I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 46, 9. And you can turn in your Bibles, if you will, Isaiah 46, 9. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring from the end, declaring the end from the beginning. From the ancient times, he declares things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. That is so good. I will accomplish all all my purpose. Folks, I think we fall into two different categories, or sometimes into both categories. When, when things happen, uh, you know, so, somebody's in, a, in, 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 you know, grief, Some, something's happening, and we think, oh, it's outside of our control, and you're trying to console somebody, a lot of times we'll say, God knows what he's doing. But then, uh, in other situations, somebody screws up, and you say, well, people have free will, so God will punish them for that. It seems to be contradictory, and so what I want us to explore, we're going to do like a little bit of meat and, meat and potatoes today, okay? So I'm going to give you the steak first, and then we'll get into all the, the potatoes and the broccoli and all the good stuff in a second. But, but let's start with the meat, and I'm just going to give you a little bit, right? It's like a filet, and yeah, it's just a little bit, but it's good. It's real good, I promise you. Uh, Look at the theology of it first, okay? So if you're taking notes, you're going to write down three different phrases, and the first phrase you're going to write down is divine determinism. So there's three different ways of looking at how God controls the world, all right? Uh, theologically speaking, this is the meat. One is divine determinism. Uh, some of the folks that follow this will say this. R.C. Sproul, you might have heard of him. He says, if there is one maverick molecule in the universe, God is not God. Paul Helm will add to that. He says, not only every atom and molecule, but also every thought and intention is under the control of God. Here's the thing. What, what folks believe here, what this says, divine determinism, is God controls everything. He knows the end and he controls the means. Every atom he controls, he wills, he, he pushes, he causes things to happen exactly the way things will happen. There is not a lot of free will here, honestly. The challenge folks will face here, those that, that oppose the divine determinism will say, well, it's, it's hard to explain if God is good uh, in that situation in any kind of meaningful way and how people are responsible for the evil they do. All right. Show of hands. Everybody has to vote. Let's do this. Who thinks this is accurate? No wrong answers. Show of hands. Who thinks this is accurate? Okay. Who thinks this is not accurate? Who wants to see more options? Who wishes I asked that question first before they raised their hand the first time? Okay. There is another option. There's two more options. There is what's called relational sovereignty. This goes the other way, and this speaks to a God that is intensely relational, that lives in the symbiosis, if you will, with humans, that is affected by humanity. He, he, he will get to the end, but also the humans will, will guide him there, right? So let me, let me read the quote here for you. Thomas Ord speaks to this. One, God affects creatures in various ways. God relates to us, and that makes us an essential difference, a.k.a. God listens. There's a relationship, just as you would listen to a friend or a wife or a sibling. Uh, there's a relationship there that overcomes that. Two, when, while God's nature is unchanging, creatures influence the loving and living creator of the universe. Universe. We relate to God, and creation makes a difference to God. The idea being is this. God is still all-powerful, 
but he limits himself on purpose in order to allow humanity to have some free will, right? So this makes the focus on humanity's free will. And then we, through our decisions, will guide the future and ultimately decide our salvation um, and other things around us. Does that make sense so far? Okay, who believes that this is accurate? Oh, you guys are fast learners. You're like thinking, okay, there's another option here. Okay, well, you might be right. There is also paradoxical sovereignty. Paradoxical sovereignty is uh, what's called a mediating view. So it believes a little bit, it seems of both. But it's also paradoxical because how could you have both? Uh, Donald Bloch, uh, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. The plan of God is predetermined. So that piece is deterministic, but the way in which he realizes it is dependent partly on the co uh, cooperation of his subject. The idea behind it, he will go on to explain, is he knows what the end is. And he knows that humanity will have, he knows all the different ways, all the potential decisions and the consequences of that and, and the decisions that flow from that, the millions, trillions, and uh, however many more, right, options that could happen. And he says, I can steer all that still, no matter how people get there, they'll still come to the end. And so uh, maybe a good way of explaining that is imagine this. If the fist is deterministic, right, you've got a hold of it. You control everything. And the open hand is relational, right? Patting people, pushing people, right? This is like the one in the middle where you take your dog by the scruff and you're like, give it to me, boy. Give, it to, give me the sock or that thing. You know what I mean? So it's a little bit of both. Or your kids, right? Shaking your baby. Spit out the Lego. Don't do that. <laughs> it's bad for your kids. Um, but, but it's got a little bit of both here where, where there is an element of God is in control but, but there is also a relational aspect of it. The challenge here is folks will say, well, it's really not one or the, or the other. Which one is it? You guys have to make up your mind. And so final, final questionnaire of the evening, now that we've got all the options on the table, who thinks the right answer is divine determinism? The first option. Okay. Who thinks it's the relational... Um, uh, relational sovereignty, second option. God lives in a relationship with humans, okay? Who thinks it's the third option, paradoxical sovereignty? Show of hands. Who did not vote and is completely confused? <laughs> Beautiful. The answer is, just kidding. I'm not going to tell you the answer. <laughs> here's, here's the reason, folks. Um, I, I didn't want to make this message about which one is the right one or which one is the wrong one. I wanted to actually lead us into a place of practically living under God's sovereignty. But I also wanted to make sure that we all understood what the different views are and that your pastor, when you go back, and, and he's going to say, well, maybe I, I believe in this or that. When I prepared um, to share this with our church uh, back at Bright, I interviewed three pastors just by phone. I probably read... Uh, I don't know how many hours worth of work on each of these items, and, and folks believe each of these very strongly, and they've got proof, and they'll, they'll, they'll have scripture to support it. Um, and I don't want to speak against that kind of work. I see scripture address this in so many ways, and I don't want us to be stuck in a place where I believe this or that or the other and miss the, the, the heart of it all, the practical aspect of it. So I'm not going to give you an answer. You can, you can dive in deeper if you will. But I want to take us from here into a way where no matter what we believe about how God controls the world, that is a mystery to me. But I want us to understand how we live in a world that God controls. Amen? You guys with me? So let's make this practical. That was the meat. You guys pack that away. Carry, here's the carry home box. I uh, Dig into it a little bit more. But let's talk about the practical aspect. How do we live practically in a world where God is sovereign? How do you walk out of here? How does your life change after today's conference? I'm going to share another Bible verse with you guys. I'm not going to tell you where this is written. Think about what prophet said this. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven 
and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? What prophet said this? Take a guess. Isaiah? Okay, I'll give you a hint. Wow, that was much hint. There were actually... Uh, there were actually images there, so never mind. No hint. Keep guessing. <laughs> Keep guessing. Come on, you guys know more than Isaiah, right? Amos, okay, good guess, close. Job, not Job. Jeremiah, no. Ecclesiastes, Solomon, no, no. Oh, man, you guys, Habakkuk? No, we're listing all of them, man. You guys are liking your table of contents right now. Just, all right, let's do this. Moses, <laughs> Jesus. What about this guy? Which prophet is that? <laughs> Daniel? It's not Daniel, but it's really close. You're getting really warm. Guess what? It's Nebuchadnezzar II. Oh, Pete, you tricked us again. Get out of here. Nebuchadnezzar II. Let me, let's dive into this story a little, boy, a little bit more, and we'll actually explore what he said. Nebuchadnezzar, I'll, I'll share a, a thought with you, and then we'll dive into the story. When we read this, first of all, uh, you read this passage, and he says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. The first thing I want us to take out of this, folks, is just this very simple point. Our sovereignty is non-existent. Our sovereignty is non-existent. Nebuchadnezzar speaks, led by the Spirit. Daniel writes it down. And, and very simply, when, it's, when, it, when it says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. God says, listen, I've done the math, all right? This has been audited. I can tell you right now, you take the earth, you take all of the creation, and it is like nothing compared to the sovereignty that I have. It is like nothing. I don't want us to confuse this, folks. I don't want to con us to confuse this with us having no value. This does not mean that you have no value. Uh, and I'll, just as a quick illustration, I've done this before uh, with our folks at home. Um, my wife recently, well, not recently, years ago, when we were still first dating, she realized that, hey, Pete likes football, so she goes out and acquires this beautiful uh, Ray Lewis signed football. And, and what I could do is I could show you an example. I went to Walmart and I bought a football, I think it's like 12 bucks, a brand new football. It looks great. But the difference, the one on the right could cost 100 bucks, and the one on the left are you guys with me? The one on the right, that one, the Ray Lewis one? It's scuffed, it's old, it's not much to look at, but it's got a signature on it that makes it very, very valuable. Whereas the other one looks brand new and it looks like, man, this, this should be the expensive one, and yet it's only 12 bucks, right? Because it doesn't have that signature. Our value comes because we were created by God. We were in, we were in his image. He, he signed us, Christian, right, believer. He is my child. Okay, so when we talk about we have no sovereignty, it's not that we are valueless. We have value because of Christ, because of God, but we have no sovereignty. We have very little, if any, control. Let's dive into the story of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4.28. Daniel 4.28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Say that three times fast. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? And the truth is he did. Historically, if you look, when he came to power after his, his father uh, uh, passed away, and he with his might went down and he conquered Jerusalem, obviously, but went down and conquered Egypt, really expanded the Babylonian Empire, made Babylon into this tremendous city. And he's looking around and he's saying, I did this. I did this. He's posting a selfie saying, me and my city. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. 
and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives them to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body, body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Let me ask you a quick question, just hypothetically speaking. Have you ever lost a fight with somebody so bad that you woke up seven years later, naked, in a field, wet, unkept? You guys ever lost a fight that bad? (laughs) That'd be pretty bad. Ever lost a fight with God? That's what happens. God takes the most powerful man on the planet at that time and says, oh yeah? Watch this. All I'm going to do is rearrange in your mind a few different neurons, a few different pathways. I'm going to give you something that's actually known today when people think they're, they're animals, it's a mental disease, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to become like an animal in your mind. And in fact, historians will go and say that towards the end of his life, there was a period of time when Nebuchadnezzar went crazy. He he, uh, was ostracized from his family. He went out and did crazy things, historically backed up. You think you're cool? Watch this. And the most powerful man that had the best medicine of that time, all the power, all the money, had nothing. Folks, our sovereignty is nothing. At at any moment, you think you control your body, control your life, you control your destiny, and something just clicks up here. God allows mental illness to happen to you, and you're nothing. You're nobody. And folks, dare speak against God. Unbelievers will say, well, I don't want to worship a God who needs my worship. I I don't want to worship God. He will ask for my forgiveness for all the bad things happening in my life. I don't need a God to help me. And God says, who cares what you think? There is a God that requires your worship. And that's the only way you're going to see eternity. I'm sovereign. Believers sometimes think, oh, God is so lucky that I worship him. He is, oh, my goodness. I came to church today. You should be thankful, God. Now give me my money. And God says, I don't need you. You need me. You need me. You worship me for you. You worship me because you need that kind of, you need to worship me. It makes you better break. It makes you holier. It, 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 it transforms you. It gives you eternal life. It gives you strength to fight sin. You need me. We have no sovereignty. Now, The next point here, if you're taking notes, his sovereignty is complete to reference back to Isaiah. He does according to his will. None can stay his hand. I've got a picture of Job here as an example. Think about Job versus Nebuchadnezzar, right? Job, that that had all this tragedy happen to him. I mean, imagine somebody texts you right now and says, hey, your parents are dead. Car accident. Somebody texts you, oh, by the way, your siblings, all in the span of a day, gone. Oh, by the way, your bank account got hacked. Your student loans just tripled. (laughs) And you're thinking, why me? Why me? And Job says, in that moment of the utmost pressure, he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 42, 2, I know that you can do all things. I know you are sovereign, God. I know you are commanding this to happen. I know you're allowing it to happen. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. If you purposed it, God, it will happen. I know I live under your sovereignty. And as all of these things kept piling on, he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
We can say that his sovereignty, his will, is manifested in different, different ways. Either he commands something or he allows something. And depending on how you believe God operates, one or the other will be, will be true. But either way, we live in a place and a time and, and under the sovereignty of God. He controls. He's above it all. He is sovereign. Scripture speaks specifically to all that he is sovereign over. And what I wanted to do is actually share text after text with you. I think there's no better way to prove this than just scripture of all that he controls. First of all, he controls the tragedy in our life. Romans 8, 18 through 21. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Folks, that's tough to read. Right? When we think God, this, this fluffy, happy, joyous God, he's all loving. He's... Creation was subject to futility, not willingly. But God in his so- sovereignty says, I'm going to subject you to futility in hope that the creation itself will someday be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We, are, we live in a world of futility. We live in a world of tragedy. Several years ago, um, we organized a hike with the youth. We took several churches in Sacramento. We said, come on, everybody, let's go. Made them all sign waivers. Went down to, I think it's Yellowstone Park, uh, like a two-hour hike up to the top of this beautiful, beautiful waterfall. You guys have seen the pictures. This gorgeous, it's like a 400-foot, 500-foot drop. Incredible place. When we get to the top, there's a pool. And if you could imagine with me, from your perspective, there's a, there's a pool of water that, that comes over these rocks and there's just a, a, a period of about white water that lasts from probably over there to here with a bridge that goes over this area and then it just drops off into the waterfall. And one of the young men that was with us, even though there were signs posted everywhere, no swimming, people were kind of dipping their toes in the water along the side decides to dive right into the pool, swims out to the center, and what you don't realize under that glass-like surface is the current is very, very strong. And as I was standing where you guys are sitting looking down, I see him being swept down. He was so panicked he couldn't speak. At some point you can see that he realizes that he's not going to make it back up the stream, and he tries to swim to the side of the pond. It was too late. As he starts to get right into that white water, he turns around. In that moment, I locked eyes with him. Everybody is yelling at him, swim, swim, swim. And at that moment, I was maybe the last person to see him as he turns over onto his back to try to ride out the white water on his uh, sitting up. And nobody ever saw him again as he is washed out and over the waterfall with his sister right there on the bank of of the river. A day later, I have to meet with his parents and see these these grieving people saying, you're responsible. You were there. You led the group. How could this happen? Why would a God do this to a family that loves him and serves him in church? They're great people and lost their only son to a hiking accident. And in all of this, we can say God is in control. He allowed that to happen. God is in control and he's sovereign over moments like that. God is in control over evil spirits and Satan. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. When there's a school shooting and we read about it, young kids getting murdered while they're learning just essential life skills, And we think, why would God allow that? And he's sovereign over that too. He allows that to happen. Disaster and war. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Man, when that first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, something people have never seen before, when hell opened up and swallowed 100,000 people in a blink of an eye, God was there. God is sovereign. The physical universe, even winds and sea, 
obey him. The sunset to sunrise, the storms, the calamities, and the beautiful beach days that we enjoy. God is sovereign. He's sovereign over everything living. Are not two sparrows sold for a, for, for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. I remember as like a 10-year-old kid, our neighbor got his first air rifle. The thing was clumsy to operate. You got to pump it up. And I decided that I wanted my turn, so I grab it, pump it up. I'm looking for a place to shoot. And we see in the bushes right by our house, this mama bird has worked all spring to weave her nest. She had laid the eggs, and she was sitting there right over them, protecting them, sitting very still, hoping she wouldn't be seen. And I take the rifle, I try to get as close as I can, I shoot her. I wound her, knock her out of the nest. She's on the ground, blood's everywhere. She's fluttering, trying to get up. It takes me forever to reload. It takes me forever to pump it back up again. I shoot her again. Man, I felt terrible that day. I was part of the futility, the curse, that this world is filled with. Filled with. And God says, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. He was in control. He allows that to happen. God is in control over the seemingly random. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Lottery numbers, random number generators, the, the intricate uh, randomness, the seeming randomness of quantum mechanics. He controls all of that. He's in control over daily events. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. Man, I'm telling you these stories and it's making you think that truly, if the Lord wills, you don't have control what you're going to do tomorrow. You don't know if you'll wake up, if you'll wake up sane. If the Lord wills. He's sovereign over nations and kings. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Folks, bad people elect bad kings, bad rulers. And, and, and a, a, a nation that is godly will elect godly rulers. God will punish the bad nation with an unjust ruler. That's the reality of it. As somebody said, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is because you're stupid and make bad decisions. <laughs> you elect a bad ruler, you get what you deserve. God is in charge and over the actions of men. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You can think and do and plan whatever you want. And at the end, what God said will happen, will happen. A secular neighbor heard his neighbor, an old lady, you know, down in the south. Um, and she likes to go out on her porch and pray um, every morning. And it just drove him nuts. He's just had enough of it about this lady that was just so loud about her faith, so obnoxious it seemed to him. And, and he hears her one day, her uh, social security ran out, the money ran out, and so she's praying, Lord, I've got, I've got three more days till my check comes in. If you could, I need you to provide for me. I could, I could use some, you know, this and that. And she kind of creates a shopping list, and he's like, I've got an idea. So he runs down to the store, buys all the stuff on her shopping list, comes back, sets it out on her front porch, rings the bell, kind of hides on the side. She comes out. She's like, thank you, Jesus. You provide. And he comes out and says, no, guess what? It's me, your neighbor. I did it. And I want to prove to you that God doesn't answer prayers. And she's like, thank you, Jesus, even more. You used atheist money to buy it. <laughs> Lord, the Lord does provide. He's sovereign over the actions of men. He's sovereign over our salvation. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, that's so important. Folks, when you're dead, you don't rise yourself to life, or else we'd all have zombies walking around. When you're dead, you're dead. But he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. All of that goes back to Isaiah when God says, I am God. 
when the being that we worship, that infinite, all-powerful, super, hyper-intelligent creature that is above all of this, that we call God and we worship that being, and when that being says, I will accomplish all my purpose, the being that created it all, he will accomplish all his purpose. And folks, I hope that gives us comfort because that being is all loving. We'll get to that to a second. But when you trust that being implicitly, you understand that when God says something will happen, it'll happen. All of a sudden, you approach life differently. You think, there's no obstacles, as somebody once said. There's no obstacle too big to overcome. When you're Moses and you can go into the, the, the palace the throne room of Pharaoh, the most powerful leader of that time, with a stick. And say, hey, I want to uh, ruin your economy, Pharaoh. I'm going to take all of your labor force with me. What are you going to do about it? Catch me outside. Right? When you're David and Goliath, or sorry, when you're just David, Goliath got the, uh, the bad side of that deal. And you come out with a sling and a stone. When... When you're God's people, folks, when you're Gideon, I'll give you this one, the original 300 movie, right? Gideon with his 300 men against a, a, an army of 135,000 trained soldiers. And God said, I'm going to give you victory. Man, when you believe that God is sovereign, that what he wills, he will do, you approach life differently. You live life differently. It's your dad that's got all the power. You have access to the one that controls it all. And then you don't need to be hyper-equipped for, for little tasks in life. You say, Dad, you control it all. You manage my life. You lead me. I worship you. I want to be in your will. Because you know what happens to the people that are outside of his will? Go the way of Goliath and Pharaoh and, and the 135,000 men that Gideon went against. Last point, his sovereignty is a vessel for his justice and mercy. We've already talked about that, man. When you have a good God, a God that is pure and holy, you want that God in control. You want him to have complete sovereignty. Read this with me. J.I. Packer says, God's providence is the unceasing activity of the creator. This is a lot, folks, so unpack it with me. Unceasing, constantly, right? In whereby in overflowing bounty and goodwill, I'll, I'll translate that into millennial language. He's good. <laughs> He's very good. He upholds his creatures in ordered existence, guides, governs all events, circumstances, and what we see as free acts of angels and men, and directs everything to its appointed goal for his own glory can we just say that's real good? Just say good. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll get you guys talking. That's good. That's real good. He constantly, unceasingly, out of his goodness, pours out that goodness in his sovereignty. His sovereignty becomes a vessel for his goodness to lead us to his glory, to do what is for his glory. Let's go back to that story of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember we left him outside? naked, with hair unkept, like an animal. Daniel 4, 34. I think I've got this. Well, I don't. We'll get to that in a second. I know you guys are interested now. Uh, well, in fact, I'll speak to that now, since you guys are interested. This is my wife driving. Not really my wife, but the look on her face is my wife driving. And I use this to explain an illustration. When I'm driving, she just she holds on to that little the little you know uh, bar that's right there, um, and she's scared for her life. And her favorite words is "keep your distance, keep your distance." But when she's driving, I'm holding on to the bar. And and I'm not saying that she's a terrible driver. I'm not saying that publicly on record. Um, but what I am saying is that I know that her heart is in the right place. <laughs> and she wants to get me there safely. 
and I can trust her that she's not going to be a crazy person that's like, I'm going to speed up, and you know what? I've got a working airbag, and you don't, so who cares? I understand her intent is to get me there safely and, and efficiently and, and correctly. And so no matter where the road goes, and sometimes we'll, we'll make a wrong term or we'll go too slow or too fast, whatever, I know at the end there is, there is good intent there. Now you couple that with how we view God and we understand that no matter what happens in our life, there is good intent behind that. And the one that has that good intent does not make mistakes. So like a doctor that must amputate certain parts of us, that must cause us pain in order to bring us health, we, we trust our Savior. We trust our God. We return to King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And the glory of my kingdom and my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors, my lords, sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. I think about so much of what happens to us that we think, oh, God hates us. All, all he does is he's trying to humble us. All his works are right and his ways are just. And so, what's our response? I'll give you four. How do we respond to a God that is sovereign and loving? Point number one, you take accountability for your own mistakes and apostasy. Uh, Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Folks, I never want to be like the kids, oh, sorry, like the parents that drop their kids off at Sunday school, you know, and then they come back and the Sunday school teacher's all haggard and she says, Mom, Dad, we really have serious, we, we, we think maybe your kid is possessed because <laughs> it's been bad. And the parents stand up for their kids and say, no, 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 my kids are great. They're angels. They're great. You know, and they said, no, it's like she ripped out this girl's hair. No, they're great. Well, how dare you speak again? I don't want to be that parent. When somebody comes to me and says, Pete, you live in sin. You've got something in your life that you need to confess. I want to be the one that says, tell me, speak to me, accuse me, convict me. Let me know. Show me, Father, where am I in a wicked way? Teach me. Two, when we know we love, we are living under the sovereignty of God, the complete sovereignty of God. It is the purpose for us to draw nearer to God. Philippians 3.8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. The, word, the value of Christ is worth more than any pain, any loss that we might experience here. Habakkuk 3.17, listen to this. The prophet, he says it's with so much beauty. It's like, a, it's like a high cue almost. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fall and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, there be no herd in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. The mother of a child born brain injured wrote these words. We would have called our daughter's handicap the greatest tragedy of our lives if it were not for the fact that it came, that we know that it came from the Lord. Words cannot fully express our keen disappointment when our little girl failed to experience normal mental development. Her condition made us understand just a bit how our dear Savior must feel when his children do not mature spiritually. The Lord knows that heartaches, if properly accepted, will enrich our lives in a way that could not happen otherwise. Strengthened in the inner man, we come through our trial bigger and better Christians with a fresh and brighter testimony. We draw nearer to God through our trials, knowing that he is sovereign. 
Third, we trust and rejoice in his sovereignty. Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good and for those who are called according to his purpose. A.T. Pearson, the storms which threaten to uproot, uh, uproot the trees really root them more firmly deep in the soil. Remember we talked about yesterday the stress wood? It makes it stronger. If he is completely good, completely sovereign, then we can step out in faith because we trust his love. We trust his laws. You trust him in your dating life. You trust him in your marriage. You trust him in your relationship, in school, in work. I remember as a college kid, Sunday nights was our youth service, and I would just want to stay at home because I've got, you know, I've got classes in the morning, and I've got homework to do. I'm busy. And my parents would always say, listen, Pete, do you trust God? I mean, literally, do you not understand that those who trust God, those that take care of God's work, God takes care of their work? Why don't you take an hour and a half pause and go attend the youth service, and don't worry about it. Come back and... and, and, and Spend a couple of hours later at night. Plan better next time. And guess what? I graduated. <laughs> Everything was fine. And I attended those youth services, and they were a huge blessing for me. And I know so many parents and kids here, folks, you know that you do that. And we find excuses to skip Sunday services and youth services and groups and other things, and we use everything as an excuse under the world, under the heavens, because we don't trust God. We don't think he'll take care of ours. Finally, lastly, live in obedience to his purpose. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I anointed you a prophet to the nations. Folks, this, this isn't just to Jeremiah. This is to all of us. God created you for a purpose. I promise you, it's not so you could finish college, get married, get a job, retire, collect seashells on the beach. That wasn't his. I've got a bright idea for Ivan. I know what he's going to do. That wasn't his purpose for you. Man, he wants you to expand his kingdom. He wants you to be just on fire for him. To live in that love. To live in trust. I'll finish with this illustration. You guys know when you see the Olympics uh, or um, other you know, competitive sports, specifically gymnastics, and these girls, man, they train hard, and they step out onto that balance beam, and the clock starts ticking, and they run out, and then they do stuff like this that would break me. <laughs> uh, you know. And they've trained, and they've got their trainers right there on the sides to catch them if anything happens, and finally they stick the landing, and the judges, the, 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 the crowd applauds, and the judges give them a score. Highly trained athletes that have earned every single one of those applause, uh, uh, every single bit of that applause. And then you see us as believers. You see us believers, we get onto that balance beam. Francis Chan illustrates it so well. He says we get onto that balance beam, and then all of a sudden the clock starts ticking, and the first thing we do is... <laughs> <laughs> and we hold on tighter as the clock winds down, and then finally at the end, we stand up and we think, ah, there it is, Lord, I've lived my life. Applaud. Look at me, I've trusted you the whole time. And we put on our spiritual little bicycle helmet and floaties and we live our life for ourselves with no trust in God and complain to him anytime anything happens to us that disturbs our discomfort. And we think we live in his will and that we're glorifying God. And that at the end of your life, you'll stand before God and say, well, where's my reward for living life? I went to church. Folks, if we live in a world, if you truly live on a planet that is under the complete sovereignty of God, the complete sovereignty of a loving God that would sacrifice his only son for you, then where is the Christian living? Prove to me, don't prove to me, prove to God, prove to yourself that you trust that God, that you believe God has sovereignty. Man, when can we step out in faith finally? When can we do incredible things, go to incredible places, say incredible things to the people that are close to us? Just trust him finally and say, Lord, no matter what storm I go through, blessed be your name. 
Let me live for your glory and not mine. Let me live so that you're honored and not for my comfort. We live for a God and under the power of a God that has complete sovereignty. And I, I just pray that we can all lean into that tonight. As we leave here, that our lives might be changed by that. If you live in fear that you might have release tonight, that you might have um, com uh, comfort and confidence in him. If you lived in a life that was all about you, that that might change and you might live for a God that loves you intensely and, and controls your life. Amen.